Good morning, Forefront. Uh, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming out. Even though it's not snowing this week, it's still frigid cold. So I appreciate your valiant effort to, to be here this morning. As we're in the third week of our series called The Wander Years, and we're going to look at the story today of Jesus taking his own journey um, of kind of wrestling with beginning his ministry and the miracles and signs and, and what it looked like for him to use his gifts in certain ways um, to bring equity and extravagant generosity to others. Uh, you know, over the span of my time in ministry, um, I've performed over 40 weddings. And during that time of performing those 40 weddings, I would say a majority of those weddings, I unfortunately never enjoyed. Um, you're like, oh my gosh, that's so dark. Like, why would you admit that? Um, reality was, is the reason I didn't enjoy it was because in the early part of my ministry, until my mid-20s, um, I, I never thought I was going to be able to get married myself. Um, nor be partnered or have love and experience the things that I was bringing people together for all the time in these weddings. And so I dread weddings. And I dreaded weddings so much that I would, I would tell the sort of passive-aggressive joke at some point during the ceremony. So when it would come time to exchange the wedding rings, I would tell this joke about how there are four rings of marriage. I would say first comes the engagement ring, then comes the wedding ring, then comes the prospering, and then comes the suffering And I would emphasize the suffering and how hard marriage was going to be and and how difficult and sacrificial and all they were going to lose combining themselves. This was my therapeutic moment to just be like, this really does suck for them. You really got the good end of the stick, getting to, you know, be single and celibate the rest of your life. This just seems so great for you. Can you tell why I was bitter? I was upset. And and I struggled with doing weddings. And then it was in my 30s, uh, now in my 30s, that I, I've really begun to appreciate and enjoy and love weddings. Once I was able to reconcile my sexuality in my late 20s, I, I really started to, to love them, and I dropped the dark joke. And now, as I plan my own wedding, um, I never thought that I would be a... Thank you. Um, I never thought I would be a groomzilla, but I am indeed. Uh, I, I always looked at those people that, at weddings and uh, brides and so forth usually, and I would just be like, uh, oh my gosh, please just chill out. You're fine. It's going to all come together. Don't worry about every detail. And I'm over here worrying about every detail. I want it to be perfect, and I want it to be just right, and I want everyone to be happy, and I want everyone I love to be there. And reality is, is if you've ever been a part of a wedding or you've ever had a wedding yourself, you know that nothing ever goes exactly the way you want it to. Not everybody that you want is there. Not everyone is happy with the decisions you've made about how you want everything to be done. Weddings just don't usually go off without any problems. And today, in our text today, we enter the scene of a wedding. We don't know who it's for. We don't know Mary or Jesus' relationship to the people who are having this wedding. But we do know that they've been invited to this gathering. And at this wedding, not everything goes right as we anticipated. And they run out of wine. And unfortunately, uh, during this time, people didn't go on honeymoons either. Instead, instead of like just a few hour reception after a wedding, it was a seven day honeymoon celebration at the groom's house. This was custom. And so can you imagine, I mean, I'm just looking at the bill for our wedding for just a few hours on one day. I can't imagine the luxury and how expensive it would be to try to host family and friends for seven days and to provide wine for all of them. Now, here's the interesting thing to also think about when you think about that. Uh, it's the reality is that people thought that uh, by the level of booze you were serving revealed your level of prospering, your level of wealth, and what resources you could have and you could give. And so if you were, of course, to run out of wine, everyone would start whispering little things about you and about your wedding, which people probably do that regardless, right? Now, at Austin and mine's wedding, we have a cash bar because we're not quite prospering yet. So uh, people will probably have plenty of whispers about that, I'm sure. I digress, though. This wedding party, though, as they run out of wine, they're entering into the fourth ring of marriage, and they're suffering. So enters Mary to save the day in this story. Mary approaches Jesus, and she says this to Jesus in verse 3 of our story today. She says, The wine supply ran out during the festivities. So Jesus' mother told him, "They They have no more wine. So she comes to Jesus with the problem that has occurred. Now, I just want to acknowledge this, that I realize there's some of us in the room today um, that perhaps we are in recovery and we're dealing with substance abuse or what that looks like in our own lives, and that's heavy. And so hearing a story about Jesus turning water into wine can actually make us a little unsettling and also cause maybe doubts or questions or even feelings of temptation and wonder about that. I also realize that for some of us, like myself, who grew up with 
uh, a father who deals with substance abuse, that sometimes um, when you think about wine and alcohol, you get triggered to the ideas of what happens when a parent or a loved one gets drunk and sometimes how they can become violent, whether that's with our words, as sticks and stones do break our bones, and so do words hurt us, right? And so these things also cause us pain. And so I realized that as we talk about a story today about water into wine and a party, sometimes those memories and those thoughts and those feelings about our attachment to those, the abuses of those things can, can really rise to our surface. So I just want to acknowledge that as well as we, as we read the story today and, and know that I hold that space with you and that tension um, this morning. So Jesus' response to his mother, though, is this, Dear woman, that's not our problem. <laughs> Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby, there were six stones of water, water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. I have a hard time just carrying one gallon of milk home from the bodega at home. I can't imagine 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars were filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instruction. You know, I, when it's interesting to think about this idea, right, of, of extravagance and how much the, the host could, could provide in drinks was a revelation of, of how much that family was prospering or not. And I think about the idea as well of the prosperity gospel that many of us probably know or are familiar with, whether you grew up in it or you've heard it in our culture or you've read Joel Osteen's book um, or seen his talks online or any of the other prosperity gospel preachers, this idea, right, that if you, if you give a lot and, you, and you'll be healthy and wealthy, and that is a sign of God's blessings on your life. And, and I, this is uh, sadly still a thing that happens in a lot of our lives today, right? Like this idea, this belief that if I'm good, good things will happen to me. I'll be really blessed. I'll have great things. And when in reality, I, I think so often the idea of prospering, we, 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 we've, we've narrowed it in on, on money and wealth. When, when I don't actually know that that's all the time, most of the time, how I see Jesus show up when he brings prospering. I think sometimes it's in ways that go beyond our human understanding and what all humans could have access to or not. But instead, it's often in the levels of how we relate with one another, how extravagant and prospering he is. So, for instance, I know about a lot of us at this church. We came to this church not because we have a ton of money and we have marble floors and a bookstore in our entryway, all wonderful things in certain places and places and time. But for many of us in this church, the reason we've come is because of our wide and extravagant welcome of inclusion. I know there are many in this church watching this morning on the live stream as well as here in person that decided to come to this church because we were so willing to fill the glasses and to fill the jars and the cups to overflowing that all would be welcomed in this place. That we weren't just trying to sort of cut the corners and cut the edges and, and just barely get by, but instead we, we wanted all to be welcomed. Reality is, is most churches don't have a lot of the diversity that, that exists in this church, whether that's racial diversity or gender diversity in leadership, or whether that's LGBTQ representation, and that's not an easy thing to do, quite frankly. It's a hard thing to do. It's why so much of our world is divided, because people sort of go off into their corners with people who know and understand and speak and believe and, and act and think and look like them. But to have a church where people are coming together with all their differences— and trying to learn and grow and stretch from one another, to me, this is an extravagant expression of a generous gospel. And this is why so many of us, I know, are in this church. Uh, Reverend Vernida, on her commissioning Sunday, talked about how this church was founded by four straight cis white men. And at the time of the founding of this church, she likely would not have been hired. But now, ten years in, as we're getting ready to celebrate our ten-year anniversary this September... This church has taken a long journey and long inward look and work. We talk about the beginning of our service, how we're working to be actively anti-racist and, and inclusive of the LGBTQ community, as well as involving women in the full life and leadership of this church, unlike some congregations. And reality is, is this church has taken a journey to wanting to have a jar that was maybe only filled a little bit to a jar that is filling overflowing. A jar that maybe just looked and tasted like one thing to a jar that was flavorful and overflowing and bountiful. We worship a Jesus who doesn't just want us to just drink water. I know you said you loved water. I asked you what your favorite beverage is. You're like, water. I'm like, you're kidding me. Tell me the truth. You don't lie to me, right? And you're like, no, water. Water is my thing. I'm committed to it, right? And reality is, is I bet if we all talk to everybody in this room, there's a lot of different tastes and flavors of what you would like to drink. There's a lot of tastes and flavors of representations of faiths, backgrounds, and histories in this room. That is an extravagant welcome. 
I know that for some of us, we've also come to worship at this place because of an extravagant overflow of generosity. Uh, This is a place that many of our emotional and physical and mental and spiritual needs have been met in ways that other churches just couldn't and wouldn't. And we couldn't bring all of ourselves or express all the things we needed. Or we had to prove ourselves in order to ever be accepted there. I was just speaking... um, just a couple weeks ago with Xanifa, and Xanifa gave me permission uh, to share this story. But when she and Fabi first came to the church, uh, they, got really, they, they, they didn't want to get really involved right away because they had been involved in a lot of churches really quick and burned out throughout their lives and really just kind of overcommitted. And so they said they, they were coming, they were, they, were, they were attending, they were getting to know people, getting connected, falling in love with this community. And in the midst of that, they really wanted to go to this retreat, but then that point in their lives, they just couldn't afford it. And she tells me the story of how pay, Forefront went forward and paid for her to, be able to go, go to that retreat, how much that meant to her. And she said then, then not long later, she says her and Fabi got in a terrible car accident in, in August 20, 2019, and the church set up a meal train for them. And she's like, they don't even know me, and they're doing this for us. They don't even know me that well, and yet they're, and we haven't even done anything for them to, to do this, to give this back, to, to love us in this way. And then she said it went even further. She said in January 2020, she said, my, her father passed away. And she said there was no way with this unexpected death that they could have afforded this funeral. And Forefront was able to support and help them in, in, in having a funeral for their family and the worship team playing at his funeral. Fabi says to me, the reason that she has served as the care deacon for the last few years is because of what Forefront has done and for them. This is her way and opportunity to be able to give back and to love and to care in a way that she's been cared for others. And so throughout this pandemic, she's been on the forefront, pun intended, of hearing some of your requests from the care team of ways you have financial, emotional, and physical needs that need to be met. And she's always there to help overflow the top of that, to turn what that water is into something beautiful, into wine, something extravagant, and she wanted me to also mention when I shared this story that, that one of the things about this story that means the most to her about her journey here at Forefront was that this was the first church where they did something good for her before she had to do a bunch of good things for them first. And I think there's something beautiful about this story of Jesus coming to the situation that Mary brings before, her, before him. And he's got a moment to decide what he's going to do. He's got a moment to decide how he's going to handle it. God is seen in all the ways we, we ex- extravagantly fill up and have been filled up by other people often. Jesus is not here to turn all the waters into wine nowadays, but we are. And Jesus has given us his spirit so that we can do even greater things than he did. So that we can go in, turn the water into wine, the places and spaces where people's wine, where people's wine has run out and they need to be filled again. Those places and spaces where there is scarcity and we are people who can bring abundance. There's a beautiful story of a wedding in Cana reminds us that God is present where the wine has run out, waiting to be revealed in extravagant abundance. It's a quote from the stewardship consultant of the Mennonite Foundation. So my my question for you today is this, is, is perhaps the beauty of this story is not so much about the water into wine, but it's about the abundance and the overflow and the the amazing uh, provision that Jesus provides. I mean, why else provide us all these details about how large the jars were, how how much wine there was, how good the wine was, that they would bust the good wine out at the end of the party when everyone's already feeling it and the party's kicked in and they can't even really appreciate and enjoy the flavor and taste of it. I think that this story tells us these details because it's, it's not so much about the amazing thing that the water turns into wine, but instead it's this extra, it's amazing extension of Jesus' extravagant abundance to love and to bring equity where there is scarcity. To be extravagant, to bring a need. So church, church, where has the wine run out for you this morning? Have you run out of patience with at-home learning, working from home? I know my fiancé, Austin, has definitely run out of patience from working from home because I'm there. And he's an introvert. And he's like, just don't even look at me right now. <laughs> um, have you run out of patience with the church's lack of inclusivity? Maybe not this church, but churches as a whole. And you're like, I don't even know if I want to give church another shot again. I'm just tired. I've just, I've just run out of wine. Have you run out of patience with not being able to date during the pandemic or, or finding the right person? It's just so hard and lonely and isolating, and it just seems so difficult to get back out there. Have, have you run out of patience with the job that sort of just sucks the life out of you and you just want something different? Have you run out of patience and energy with exploring your faith afresh again? Have you run out of patience and need God to fill you back up so you can run this next stint of the race? Where has the wine run out for you?
I'm here to tell you this morning that God often fills our jars back up with something we didn't expect, by someone we often didn't anticipate, on a timeline that often wasn't ours, and for purposes we often just don't understand. This is the God that we worship. This story of God turning water into wine still perplexes us and causes us to wonder and question as all scripture should do. Sometimes I wonder if Bible studies shouldn't be called wonder studies. Because every time we come to the text, we find ourselves wondering, what does that mean? Why is that way? How do we understand what the heck is going on in this text? And that's the beauty of it. It's always to call us to wonder. Wonder what God is up to in the text and in our midst. And sometimes God even provides more than what we need. When I was a kid uh, in, in first grade, um, <laughs> I would always take a snack. You ever have snack time in, in school as a kid, right? And, and it was like the best. You just waited for that, be able to bust that snack out. It was, it was, for me, it was always a sweet thing. Uh, but then they changed the rules. They're like, oh, it's got to be healthy. Liberals. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, but really, though, that's what I thought when I was a kid. Um, and so I was like, okay, I get to bust out my, my sweet snack now. And there were times and times again, I would, I would open up my desk and my snack would be gone. I'm like, where did my snack go? I know, I know I put my snack in this desk. Eventually, I, I began to realize and figure out what was happening. Uh, there was a, one of my classmates who kept stealing my snack. And when I found out that it was him, because I caught him eating my snack in the bathroom... I went home ready for hellfire and brimstone to rain down on this first grader. Like, I was just ready for my grandma to just rush in there and save the day and tell the principal and tell the teacher and this child to just never steal from me again and to know to not mess with Josh Lee. I went home and told my grandma all that. I was so upset. I was just ready for her to rush into school because that's what she she would normally do. If, If anything happened to me, my grandma always just rushed to my aid. But my grandma this time, her response was quite different than I anticipated. She said, well, he's probably hungry. She said, from this point on the rest of the school year, you will take two snacks to school, and you will give him one snack when it comes to snack time. That taught me something really profound. I gave him that snack, and that just made us kindred spirits. We became friends, and we always lobbied to have our desks next to each other. And a lot of kids didn't want to be friends with him because he always had snot running down his nose. You know that kid? <laughs> always, and he would just, he, he would, this is the way he'd wipe it, just like a wiper. And it would just be gone. No one wanted to be his friend. And so, and I, and I, and so I was like, I got to help this kid, like, solve this problem. And I had, I had my own personal box of Kleenexes, you know, in my, in my, it was, how did they not know I was a homosexual? And so I had them in there, and so I would reach in, and I, and I started handing him, you know, under the desk, like, hey, you got to wipe your nose, bro. And so he'd wipe his nose, and, and that was that. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I never realized until I was literally reflecting on this sermon this week, and a friend asked me, whatever happened with you and that kid after you gave him your snack? And I started thinking about our friendship. And I started thinking about the Kleenex. And I began to realize he, if he couldn't afford a snack to come to school, he definitely couldn't afford a box of Kleenexes to come to school like the rest of the kids. And I thought, wow, I never even realized that Kleenex was a luxury. A box of Kleenexes. And I, and I, I hear and I, and I think about that story and the ways in which God... Um, used me, but more than that, used my grandma to mold me about what it looked like to realize that the problem here wasn't stealing. The problem here was hunger. And so often we want to punish the crime without ever asking, well, what's the reason for that? Where does that come from? How do we get to the systemic issue there that's actually going on and occurring? And as Jesus turns this water into wine, I I can't help but think and wonder about what was the situation surrounding why they ran out of wine. We never ask that. We never wonder about why did they run out of wine? Was this person who was having this meal for this party, was, were they poor? Did someone steal from what had been set aside for the party? Was the party wine ruined in some way? Did, did the wine attendants have a heavy hand and just not proportion it all out very well? Was this the first day, the third day, the seventh day of, of, this, of this groom's and bride's gathering? I don't know. We're not given the answers to these questions, but, but we often make assumptions or we don't assume at all. But Jesus chooses, well, no matter what, the reason is to bring equity by providing for an unfortunate situation in this story. Because he knows that people will talk. They will be ashamed in this culture and society. And Jesus helps them save face in this moment. Jesus reaches across the way and gives them a snack and a Kleenex. So I invite you to, for a moment to take stock of your surroundings today. 
you may be empty, and maybe you're the one this morning that's in this room in need of a snack or a Kleenex. Maybe you're the one in this room this morning that's in need of a babysitter to just give you a break from your kids for a little bit. Maybe you're the one in need of a financial or emotional support after the death of a loved one or after an accident. Or maybe perhaps you're the one in this season of your life who has an extra snack, who has an extra Kleenex to extend. And perhaps you're the one in the room this morning who, who has some extra time to volunteer a few hours to that parent to give them a break. Perhaps you're the one in the room with an extra financial support to be able to provide some uh, resources for somebody who's in need or spend some quality time with somebody who's lonely or grieving or needing space to just be heard. So my question to you this morning is this. Do you need to be a Mary today? Do you need to be a Mary today and name the needs that are around you for you or for others and advocate? Or maybe you need to be the Jesus today. What jars of water around you is the Spirit calling you to fill and transform with abundance and extravagance? What needs is the Spirit calling you to change and transform, to make new? It's just the power and resources you have in your hands. I don't know who you are today, but I do have this to tell you as you go back into the world. Go turn some water into wine, church. Amen and amen.